So um, we're just going to go live now on YouTube. I want to make sure that we're uh, muted on YouTube or we'll hear ourselves twice. So just give me one tick. Yeah, muted. Okay, perfect. So um, welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum and our talk uh, to accompany the fantastic silver gilt chalice which we have on display in the museum currently. Some of you may have read the article in the Times Union at the weekend about it. Uh, we believe the chalice dates from about the 15th century. It was found kind of miraculously in a cardboard box in a garden uh, in an outhouse in England, centuries after it was more than likely looted from an Irish church or monastery. There were only a handful of chalices from this era which still exist, so it may have either been hidden or buried, you know, um, after its removal from Ireland. You probably know that Henry VIII, of course, was the one in England who broke ties with the Catholic Church to found the Church of England during his reign in 1509-1547. And he ordered a, a huge reform of religious life and institutions across England and Ireland, including, of course, dissolving or the dissolution of the monasteries. But as we all know, Catholicism uh, survived in Ireland, although it wasn't uh, an accurate or kind of a catechized form of Catholicism until the late 19th century. So tonight we have Dr. Malgajorta Doughton, who is the senior lecturer at the School of History in University College Cork, who has published on Irish illuminated manuscripts, manuscripts, the cultural history of Irish mendicant orders. And she is a member of uh, a team, along with people from the National Museum of Ireland, who are condu conducting different scientific and museum tests on the chalice to try uh, to discover as much as they can about it. So we're delighted to have you with us. Um, uh, Dr. Dalton, we call you Gosha for starters, uh, you know, <laughs> and anyone who's in the Zoom meeting live with us, you can just hover over the screen and the Q&A feature will pop up and you can type in a question uh, there or a comment and we'll take them at the end of the, the presentation. Now, um, Dr. Dalton cleverly pre-recorded her talk because we have had issues with Irish talks in the past. I don't know if it's at night or the Internet mm -hmm. or something, but sometimes the camera you know, freezes and stuff. So we're going to play the talk and then come back in for a live Q&A. Yep, so, yeah, um, perfect. I, yeah. yeah, good. Yep, so yeah. I'll share that now. <laughs> and then yeah, there'll be no you. technical glitches, we hope. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so thank you, Elizabeth. No problem. Thank you. We're delighted to have you. Looking forward to this. Good afternoon and thank you for joining this presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Elizabeth Stack uh, for, invita for inviting me to do this talk, which coincides with a display of a late medieval chalice in the Irish American Heritage Museum. I hope that some of you will get a chance to see this artifact and indeed some of you may have already viewed the object. My talk today will attempt to contextualize the chalice, so I will start by outlining some preliminary findings on the artifact before discussing the role of chalices in the church and liturgy more broadly. I will then focus on medieval friaries in Ireland and their material culture. These are the areas of my ongoing research. Friaries, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, are houses of the religious orders that are known as friars, meaning brothers. As a religious phenomenon, the movement of a mendicant, that is, begging friars, emerged in the early 13th century. Following from that point, I will concentrate on the Franciscan order in Ireland, and that will allow us a more focused analysis of liturgical objects and the circumstances of their loss and their survival. At the end of the talk, I will come back to the chalice with some concluding remarks and information of the future of the research. So let us begin by looking at the chalice. To date, the chalice has undergone stylistic and technical analysis in Cork and Dublin. Regarding the stylistic and historical analysis, these are conducted by myself and an MA student, Richard Keith MacDonald. As far as the technical analysis is concerned, the chalice is investigated in the Tyndall National Institute at University College Cork by the Inks and Skins project and by Dr. Paul Malarkey at the National Museum of Ireland who x-rayed the chalice. The object was also 
3D scanned in Bull Library at UCC. So the chalice, when we look at it, uh, looks relatively small. It's 16 centimeters in height. It consists of three sections, a simple conical bowl, an engraved stem with a decorated knob, shown on the right, and a circular foot. The knob, as you can see, is the most ornate and probably the oldest part of the artifact. Around the middle part of the knob there are 12 lozenges. These are diamond shapes that here are filled with plant motifs, which in turn intersect to form the X shape, which is indicated by the upper arrow on the slide. One of the lozenges, however, bears the sign of a cross, which is indicated here by the lower arrow. This is a small, yet symbolically significant detail, and that was noticed by Dr. Paul Malarkey from the National Museum, and I will come back to that point later. Above the lozenges, these diamond shapes, uh, there are six lobes, each decorated with a leaf design. Between the lobes there are designs that look like elongated Gothic lancet windows. Below the lozenges, similarly, there are six lobes filled with leaves and six lancet window designs. But these leaves in the lower section of the knob differ from those in the upper part of the knob, showing a variety in design, a high level of detail and great craftsmanship of a silversmith who executed this part of a chalice. The foot of a chalice, as you can see, is circular. Within it there are three small holes and a rivet and they suggest that the foot originally had a figure of Christ crucified or the image of a cross that was attached to it. The knob, on account of its decoration, allows for some comparative analysis with other Irish and non-Irish objects. So I'm going to present some of um, those stylistic comparisons now. So for example, diamond-shaped lozenges feature on the knob of a late 15th century Irish chalice known as the De Burgo O'Malley chalice which is held, housed in the National Museum in Dublin. But these lozenges also appear on late medieval English chalices such as those in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. These surviving English chalices are typical of thousands that were used in England before the Reformation. And I'd like to thank here uh, Richard Keys MacDonald for sharing with me his findings on stylistic comparatives. We encounter lozenges on the chalices that were made across continental Europe, in places such as Germany, the Low Countries and Poland. We can also see the lozenge motif being continued well into the early modern period, as exemplified by the Irish chalices that were executed in the, in the first half of the 17th century. Like lozenges, the lancet window design was an international motif that featured on on liturgical objects which were created in Ireland but also elsewhere in medieval Europe. So on the previously mentioned Irish de Burgo O'Malley chalice, window designs are engraved on the stem both above and below the knob. On the Polish chalice that I also uh, mentioned, this chalice is from Silesia, the window designs kind of dramatically swirl around the knob and are reminiscent to Art Deco, in fact. Then let us have a look at the foot of um, our chalice. So feet of late medieval chalices are typically hexagonal or octagonal, that is either six or eight-sided which is not the case here. The unusual shape of the foot, which is combined with 
technical analysis suggests that the chalice is in fact a composite object with the stem possibly belonging to an earlier object and the bowl and the food being of a later date. So what has been revealed so far through the technical analysis? So these are just uh, some preliminary findings and we will have more research, um, more comparative research done next week in the National Museum in Dublin. So in investigating the chalice, the inks and skins team used XRF, which is non-invasive portable X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. The instrument was positioned close to the artifact surface. And then the X-ray beam, which is the red dot on the image, which signals the area of analysis, was directed at three distinctive areas of the artifact, namely the bowl, the foot and the knob. And this served to analyze metals that were used in respective parts of a chalice, which in turn can shed light on the production process and hence the story of the artifact. So, for instance, traces of mercury in the elemental composition of an analyzed alloys suggest that the gilding was achieved through the application of a gold mercury amalgam. And that is a gilding method that was used since antiquity. Uh, so far, this non-destructive XRF method revealed that silver copper alloy was used in the production of a chalice. So first, we have the silver copper alloy used to make the structure of a chalice, so to speak, and then the gilding is applied. So the silver copper ratio in the chalice bowl, along with the component of lead in the bowl, is different to that in the lower part of a chalice. And that is important because it suggests different manufacturing techniques for the bowl and for the foot. It may also suggest different times of execution or different workshops. In conducting the stylistic and technical analysis of a liturgical object, it is important to remember that in its very essence it is exactly that. It is a liturgical object. It was an object made for and used in, lit in liturgy. And the decorative scheme of the artifact, in fact, reflects its, its sacred role. So let us have a look at um, the iconography of the chalice. Uh, medieval chalices were sacred vessels that contained the Eucharistic wine and, as such, represented the real presence of the blood of Christ on the altar. The connection between the wine of the Eucharist and Christ's real presence was expressed in medieval images through a popular scene of the Mass of Saint Gregory the Great. The event involved Pope Gregory, shown here, kneeling in front of the altar. On the altar there is an open book, a pattern, a candlestick and a chalice. On top of the altar, there appears in a vision Christ, showing his wounds and being surrounded by the instruments of a passion. A visual connection is therefore established between the blood streaming from Christ's wounds and the Eucharistic wine. Pope Gregory, in this illumination, is accompanied by other ecclesiastics, including a standing bishop, as well as a lay person, possibly the benefactor. The scene takes place in a holy space, which is separated from the rest of a church by a screen. Behind the screen, the congregation of lay people look in, eagerly trying to catch a glimpse of the Mass.
root screens were a common feature of late medieval churches. The name comes from the root, that is the image of a crucifixion, that was supported by a beam. Root screens acted as thresholds between the nave reserved for the lay congregation and the chancel, the sacred place for clergy and the place of a high altar. Symbolically, screens separated sacred and profane, heaven and hell, life and death. Yet the structures were visually permeable, allowing the congregation gathered in the nave to obtain an occasional glimpse of a Eucharist. In a Franciscan friary in Ennis, located in the west of Ireland, the, roots, the rude screen is now lost. The beam that supported the crucifixion image was placed in sockets that remain visible in the west wall of the bell tower and are indicated here by black arrows. The main high altar, indicated by a white arrow, was placed below the main window of a friary, facing east towards the rising sun and symbolically expressing the hope of the resurrection. We can envision, envision the screen in Ennis as a barrier that separates, but also an opening that connects the two spaces in the church. Behind the screen, a priest celebrating the Mass was facing the altar with his back towards the congregation. As he raised the chalice, a visual connection between the chalice the altar, the east window, and the cross on the road became evident. The viewer's gaze would travel vertically towards the road and then towards the high altar, linking the cross and the chalice. The iconography of liturgical objects played an important role in the liturgical drama, especially for the priest elevating the chalice and taking the Eucharistic host on behalf of the congregation, but also for the donors who commissioned the chalice. The window designs of the chalice were reflected in the design of the east window. The centrally positioned cross on the knob evoked the cross of Christ. The twelve lozenges and the twelve lobes repeated the number of the apostles who were present at the Last Supper when the Eucharist was established by Christ. Lozenge shapes that I mentioned already appear often in Christian art and can be encountered in early medieval art including Irish and continental manuscripts. These four-sided geometric shapes take on multiple meanings. They reflect the harmony of the fourfold world with its four cardinal directions, four seasons, and four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. The appearance on the chalice could allude to the saving power of a cross, stretching to the four corners of the world. While chalices played a key liturg liturgical function, they also commemorated the donors who commissioned them. Through the act of donation, benefactors expressed their piety and could secure an ongoing prayer for themselves when their chalices were used in liturgical services. These precious objects also expressed materially the status of the donors. The inscriptions on chalices often bore the name of a donor, the date of execution, and the place for which they were made. For example, the inscription on the de Burgo O'Malley chalice reads that the object was made by Thomas de Burgo and Gronia O'Malley in the year of the Lord, 1494. The inscription indicates the role played by women as pious and generous donors and also displays the interaction between the native Irish the O'Malley's and the descendants of the Anglo-Normans, the Burgos. Chalices, as we noted, constituted an important part in the life of a religious community. 
their splendor and decoration reflected the sanctity of the object and was a part of the overall decorative program of any given church. Chalices, therefore, need to be seen as part of a larger liturgical and visual scheme of the church. In Ireland, however, these visual programs are largely lost and what typically survives from medieval monastic buildings are their grey walls. A few years ago, uh, Dr. Idel Vrnok, a colleague of mine, conceived an idea for the website that acts as a gateway to Ireland's medieval past. The Monastic Island website and the associated research project that I collaborate with provide visitors with historical information and photographs of many monastic sites across Ireland. I will focus on some of these uh, sites in order to demonstrate the fate of late medieval Irish liturgical artefacts. They give us a sense of the fragmented survival of such objects and the turbulent context in, in which sacred objects were lost or destroyed. I have selected as a case study a friary in Kilconnell, located in the west of Ireland. Kilconnell is well documented in medieval and early modern sources, which illustrate the wealth of material culture that originally would have been associated with this particular house, and more generally speaking, with their religious houses in Ireland. Kilconnell is a friary, meaning it was a house of friars, and more specifically, a house of Franciscan friars, an order established by Francis of Assisi in the early 13th century in Italy. Kilconnell was established in the 14th century or in the early 15th century by the local Lord William O'Kelly. The friary is oriented east-west with a high altar facing east. The church is divided into two main sections, the chancel with the main altar, indicated by number six, and the nave, indicated by number one and seen in the foreground. The chancel and the nave are visually and architecturally separated by an imposing tower, indicated by number five. Inside the nave, there is a splendid tomb of an unknown person, dated to the second half of the 15th century. The tomb consists of a lower tier with six carved figures of the saints. Above them, is a canopy which is flanked by two ornamental pinnacles. Atop the canopy are two sculptured figures representing a bishop on the left and Francis of Assisi on the right. Francis is shown with his hands raised, as you can see, displaying the wounds. And the six saints in the lower tier are John the Evangelist, followed by Louis of Toulouse, then there is a female saint, possibly Catherine of Alexandria, then there is a figure of John the Baptist, then a figure of James, and a male saint, possibly Dominic. The second last figure is that of James the Apostle, shown with a book, a pilgrim's staff, and a satchel. One scallop shell is attached to his satchel and another to his hat. It is possible that the tomb belonged to, a nem to somebody, a member of the O'Kelly family, who may have gone on pilgrimage to the shrine of St. James in Compostela in Spain. Openings from the nave and from the chancel lead to a cloister indicated by number eight. The cloister arcade in Kilconnell survives only partially and originally it was a covered walkway that connected the domestic buildings and the church. Surrounding the cloister were buildings that reflected the daily life of the community of friars with their rhythm of prayer and labour. 
The sacristy, indicated by number seven, was a room that was accessed directly from the church. In the sacristy, in the sacristy were vestments, church furnishings and altar plate, including chalices. And unlike the church, uh, the sacristy was not covered with a wooden ceiling, but it was vaulted to protect precious objects in the event of fire. The refectory, indicated by number 11, was the main dining room of the community, and the first floor was reserved for dormitories. So what now appears as empty spaces, grey walls and roofless structures was once filled with paintings, sculpture, stained glass windows and liturgical, liturgical artefacts, where the world of faith was communicated in a multi-sensorial manner. A visual aspect of a church was combined with tactile experiences as lay people touched the selected sacred objects. The sense of smell was activated by burning incense and the sense of hearing was open to sacred spoken words and singing. A rich visual culture of these buildings can be reconstructed from written sources and surviving material sources. And that brings me to the next section of this presentation on the survival and loss of material culture. The Friary of Kilconnell is again a good case study for the history of material culture associated with Irish religious houses. That is due to the survival of a number of 17th century written sources and of several chalices associated with the friary. An archival document dated from the 13th of July 1654 and written in Brussels concerns the objects from the convent of Kilconnell as you can see from the slide. The second line, line of the text mentions Kilconnell and the third line from the bottom mentions Brussels and the date. The Cromwellian conquest of Ireland came to an end in 1652 with the last outposts in Ulster and Connacht being defeated and the Roman Catholic clergy being imprisoned, killed or exiled. This particular document states that a person called Bernard of Laherty handed over to Father Patrick O'Hay an Irish Franciscan sacred ornaments belonging to the Friary of Kilconnell. Of Laherty appears to have taken to have taken these sacred ornaments to the continent from Ireland for safekeeping at the request of the friars. The document, unfortunately, that does not list the objects. The objects are not named on this particular uh, archival document. But the document indicates that the friars feared not only for their lives, but also for their sacred artifacts. These objects were then brought from Brussels to Louvain or Leuven in present-day Belgium. That is indicated by another archival document. And from that document we know that on the 10th of August 1654, an inventory of the Kilconnell vestments and vessels was compiled in the Irish College of St. Anthony in Louvain that had been established by the Irish Franciscans in exile. That inventory mentions over 30 pieces of vestments and in the lower right corner of the document, liturgical vessels are listed 
they include three gold chalices you can see number three indicated by an arrow below there is mention of one silver chalice here and a ciborium we see another number one the list does not provide any further details about these liturgical vessels so we have no information about their date and we have no information about inscriptions in 1687 these Kilconnell goods were taken back to Ireland during the reign of the Catholic King James II. It is only then that we learn what these five objects were, as they are finally identified in this particular source by their date or by the donors' names or both. These five objects were therefore taken from Kilconnell first to Brussels, then to Louvain, Leuven, then back to Kilconnell. They included, as we can see from this document, two objects which were associated with the O'Kelly family, who had founded Kilconnell Friary. These objects are now missing. They were the chalice dated 1409 and given to the friary by William O'Kelly and the ciborium, which is a vessel for the Eucharistic host, which was given to the friary by William's son Malachi. Both William and Malachi made significant refurbishments to the friary in the 15th century. Why did these two objects have such a significance to the friars? I think these two objects were chosen to be saved not only due to their liturgical use, but also because they symbolized the connection of the Kilconnell friars to the O'Kelly family. For the exiled and persecuted friars, the two objects associated with the O'Kelly family reinforced a sense of patronage and protection from a powerful local family. Also, at a time of persecution, the two objects evoked the memory of a friar's more fortunate past, as well as the time of prosperity in the 15th century. The Catholic hopes did not last long, and Ireland soon became the site of military and religious confrontation between the Catholic James II and the Protestant William of Orange, with the eventual defeat of Catholics at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 and William's final victory a few months later. In 1697, the Parliament of Ireland passed the Act of Banishment of all Catholic clergy from the country. Members of the Irish Franciscan province met in February 1698 and they took the decision to obey the Act of Banishment. They also decided to create inventories of their possessions. Each friary was to have two inventories made. One was a list of their possessions, books, vestments, liturgical objects, and the other was to include the names of people who were handed these objects for safekeeping. There were over 50 Franciscan friaries listed in the early 17th century sources, and even if their religious communities were no longer occupying the friary following the dissolution, the friars in most cases continued to live in the area. There are, however, only five inventories surviving from four friaries, and Kilconnell has both copies of inventories from the late 17th century. On the first inventory, a list of 28 silver object gives, objects gives the dates of 13 of them. The dates of these sacred vessels range from 1409 to 1685. And the list includes the five items which had been taken earlier to Brussels by Flaherty. The second Kilconnell 
document gives the names of trustworthy people together with an itemized list of the objects that they received. From the two Kilconnell registers that list 28 or 30 objects respectively, only four objects have been identified so far as surviving. All four of them bear inscriptions with the names of their donors and their dates of donation. The gift chalice on the left displays a beautiful, delicate and highly exquisite knob. The Egan chalice, shown in the middle, is richly decorated with the images of the crucifixion as well as images of fauna and flora that are engraved on the foot. Both of these chalices are now in the National Museum of Ireland. The third chalice, seen on, the, seen on this slide, has the sign of a cross engraved on the foot and the knob decorated with lozenges. The inscription identifies it as donated by Nehemiah Folloin and Catherine McSweeney. I managed to, to locate that particular object in a private collection and matched it with the list of Kilconnell chalices. It means that this object, made in 1628, was one of five taken from Ireland to the continent by O'Flaherty and then returned. And its rather mundane appearance disguises a very colourful story of the chalice, which reflects the, the, the fate of the Catholic Church in Ireland of the 17th century. Uh, recently, another Kilconnell chalice made in 1689 has been identified. It is also housed in the National Museum of Ireland. We learn more about the survival and dispersal of Franciscan sacred artefacts from an account written at the start of the 17th century by a Franciscan friar called Donatus Muni. His account of the Franciscan province of Ireland presents the history of the province as well as a very sorrowful state and the history of individual houses visited, visited by Friar Donatus. In the year 1600, Friar Donatus was a novice in Donegal Friary. The friary was located close to the sea, so close, as he tells us, that the friars could cast their nets into the sea just under the walls of the infirmary to catch salmon. Donatus himself was in charge of 40 suits of vestments, many were made of, gold, of, of cloth of gold and silver. He was also in charge of 16 silver chalices and two ciboria. When the friary was raided in 1601, with the friars having been forewarned, all movables were placed in a boat and Muni was among the last to leave the monastery and escaped in the same vessel. In 1602, the friary was raided again. This time the friars were not so fortunate. The sacred possessions were taken. And Muni tells us that chalices were turned into drinking cups and vestments were cut up. Donatus Muni was writing his account around 80 years after Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. And Muni's work is filled with dramatic narratives about the destruction of friaries and divine punishment on those who destroyed the friar's property. Muni mentions how chalices were taken and destroyed, stained glass windows broken, paintings disappeared, wooden as well as masonry parts of friary buildings were removed. In most cases, the perpetrators paid for their transgression through the loss of their fortune, ill health or death. 
and such was the case of two English soldiers in Kilcray Friary. Mooney describes how in 1584 two English soldiers wanted to remove the crucifix from the rude beam which would have been placed in front of a tower as indicated by the white arrow. It was a beautiful work of art, according to Mooney, decorated with medallions made of gold and silver. The two soldiers climbed up, competing for the prize possession. They began to fight. Both fell mortally wounded and died from their injuries. Stories that are narrated by Mooney are quite formulaic, but they provide important insight into the loss and occasional survival of sacred artifacts in Ireland. They also illustrate how piety is expressed through materiality and how art and architecture manifest the connection between the friars and the society. That brings us back to our chalice. By looking at the wider context of late medieval chalices, we can see that their complex stories are intertwined with human history. We can see that chalices had multiple meanings. They were liturgical objects, objects of status and prestige, and the signs of enduring faith. In the case of this chalice, its structure and its composite nature indicate that it had a complicated history. It was originally, originally made with a different bowl and a different foot. It suffered from either incidental damage or purposeful destruction. Like the Kilconnell chalices, it was considered worthy of being saved. It was repaired and then it was reused. Its continued sacred usage was emphasized by the image of Christ crucified or the image of a cross attached to a new foot. However, that image is now missing. The work on the chalice is ongoing. Uh, next week, a further technical analysis will be conducted by the Inks and Skins team. Uh, three objects from the National Museum will be analyzed using the XRF method. One of them is of confirmed Irish provenance. Uh, it is the de Burgo O'Malley chalice that I mentioned uh, during this talk. Uh, the second object will also be of Irish provenance and the third object will be a non-Irish chalice. Research on collections and on collectors at the start of the 20th century is also ongoing and may shed more light on the financier Wilson Racecott who purchased the chalice before the Second World War. So the chalice acts as a portal that opens onto the past. And I would like to end this presentation with a, with a quote from the Irish Nobel Prize winning poet Seamus Heaney. To an imaginative person, an inherited object is not just an object, an antique, an item on an inventory. Rather, it becomes a point of entry into a common emotional ground of memory and belonging. The more we are surrounded by such objects and are attentive to them, the more richly and contentedly we dwell in our own lives. Thank you for listening. Well, that was fabulous, um, Gosha. Thank you so much. Um, you covered a lot of ground Thank you. in that. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, hope that everyone was able to kind of keep up with it. Um, you know, we couldn't raise the volume anymore, but hopefully with the closed captions, it, it helped. So those of you who are online with us, if you have questions, just type it into the Q&A feature or on YouTube, you can use the chat button. Um, I did take notes and so I can kind of kick it off. Uh, one of the things that struck me as you were speaking excuse me, was the benefit that these monks had of the vast kind of um, network, yeah. I suppose, particularly within, you know, Franciscans or Dominicans, whichever order they were. 
uh, I had always thought maybe, you know, naively that it was a, a slapdash, you know, frantic run into the bog or the forest, you know, when the, the British mm. were coming. But these were able to sit down and itemize mm. things and either choose, mm. you know, wealthy lords that they may be trusted mm. or catalog everything and send them to a, mm. a, a brother monastery in the, the continent. So um, can you talk a little bit about that, like the relationship? I know we had the Irish College, you know, over in Louvain or wherever it was, but mm. is there a lot of travel between them and the continent even before the Reformation? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, to, to begin with, um, uh, Franciscans and other so-called mendicant that is begging orders, they are international orders. Mm. And... Uh, they came to Ireland from England and it was all very well planned. So, so it's not about this kind of romantic idea of uh, uh, begging friars inspired by Francis uh, going into the wild. They actually target very specifically places uh, where they want to settle. And uh, in Ireland, uh, it is uh, very much uh, connected to the Anglo-Norman settlements in the first wave of uh, the arrival of the friars. So they are part of the colonizing process. And uh, they are also at that very initial um, phase. There are some friaries uh, established uh, in the Irish speaking areas by Gaelic uh, lords. Uh, and then in the later part um, of the 15th century, when the mendicant orders are being reformed, they uh, see that as um, a means of independence uh, from the kind of community of their friars. And this is when they get support from the local lords and there are more establishments in the Gaelic areas. So um, their establishments are very much connected to local politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, uh, those local networks are extremely important. So what we see, for example, from the 17th century chalices where the inscription uh, survives is that um, uh, the um, donations came from uh, the Irish as well as, well as descend descendants of the Anglo-Normans um, that uh, frequently we have uh, chalices donated by friars themselves, so members of religious communities, and their names correspond to the names of lay donors. So what I'm saying is that um, uh, in those monastic houses, uh, we have members of aristocracy, of nobility. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there is that kind of connection uh, mm -hmm. on that level as well. Um, and um, uh, yes, so when the friars are actually uh, in the late uh, 18th century, when, when they are banished following mm -hmm. the act of uh, banishment, uh, they make those lists of tr trustworthy people. And again, it's very interesting to see who these people were. They mm -hmm. are um, uh, people of um, the noble stock, um, yeah. people who probably... Uh, um, used or who were very close to their friars who had friars as their confessors mm -hmm. who um, may have had friars as uh, witnesses to their wills so mm -hmm. it is this kind of you know very very kind of intricate yeah. uh, social fabric that we are talking about and Gosha just we talked about this briefly the other day when we were talking online like there's a very is there then a very clear difference? And I, I know you're from this later, early modern period. You know, like we were raised, of course, on stories of St. Patrick and St. Bridget. Uh, so very much an Irish grounds up church. Mm. That's a different thing, you know, in the 400s from these European model that is coming in, as you said, with the conqueror with the, with the Norman kind of invasion of the 1200s. So there's a sort of an Irish... Uh, tradition of church building in the island and then we send out people like Iona and Brendan and all of these or Iona Colum Kill to Iona mm. and then it's a different the, the friars are different they're European is that right uh, well it's a it's a European um, phenomenon okay uh, but when the friars arrive in Ireland um, they use uh, you know they, they use Latin they use English but they mm -hmm. also uh, uh, recruit from the Irish-speaking Irish areas. Okay. So, uh, for example, we see uh, uh, Franciscan uh, poets 
uh, who are members of uh, traditional bardic families. Mm -hmm. And the earliest um, uh, Franciscan poem in Ireland is actually, you know, from, from the 14th century and is uh, written by a member of uh, a bardic uh, family. So, um, we also have uh, manuscripts that are produced uh, in the later Middle Ages, where we have lives of um, continental saints, mm -hmm. but also lives of the Irish saints. So okay. there is a kind of, you know, uh, this kind of beautiful hand hand. fusion, yes, yeah. uh, that yeah. is happening. And I think the de Burgo Omali chalice that I've been um, uh, referencing, um, I think it's it's exciting because we are going to actually analyze it next week um, uh, mm -hmm. with XRF. Uh, but it shows, you know, that kind of uh, uh, connectivity between um, different traditions, the Irish mm -hmm. and, and the, the European. Anglo uh, and the European. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And I, I'll kind of leave it here. I just have two more tiny questions. Um, this one is related. Was that newer, we'll call it, wave or, of uh, monasteries and all of that being set up by the, we'll call them the Normans, Anglo-Normans, was that more in keeping with like the Church of Rome? Because apparently in the earlier days, the Irish church was very kind of willy-nilly, you know, mm. it, we, it wasn't assigned or, you know, there wasn't a city in mm. under the Gaelic. Now I'm talking about under the Gaelic system. So, you know, they kind of sprang up in monasteries and it was a quiet contemplative type of life. Whereas this is more, it seems sort of in line with Rome. Maybe there's tithes or taxes that need to be paid. And of course, they're attached to a, a large town or a city. So it's mm -hmm. a slightly different model, kind of. Well, it is, um, you know, a, a monastery, as I was showing on, on the slide, uh, kind yeah. of architecturally. Mm -hmm. uh, it follows the, uh, a diff it follows a monastic model established on the continent, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you wish. And, um, uh, you know, the situation in uh Island, but also in other border areas, is is complex, yeah. and um, uh, we do have racial tension. Uh, for example, in the Franciscan order, uh, sometimes we have again this kind of romantic notion that uh, religious orders are devoted to uh, pastoral care and the life of um, prayer. Uh, but we do have um, uh, kind of stories. Um, Again, you know, uh, the veracity of sources is questioned, but, uh, you know, there is a story about uh, a chapter, a local kind of um, gathering of uh, the Franciscan friars in Cork in uh, 1291, uh, where the Irish and Anglo-Norman uh, friars uh, came with um, uh, different papal documents. Mm. And uh, the fight broke out and allegedly six friars were killed. Oh, wow. So... Uh, uh, you know, is it true or not? It's difficult yeah. to discern because uh, this particular incident is um, copied in a Benedictine document, so maybe showing the anti-Franciscan sentiment. Yeah. So then we have another layer of kind of complexity. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, you know, when we are talking about um, the church in Ireland, uh, Yes, it is the church of uh, two nations that uh, sometimes coexist peacefully, sometimes don't. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, uh, you know, I, I put the slide from the Book of Kells there on purpose uh, as well yeah. um, uh, to show, you know, the, the kind of lozenge shape. Yes, uh, yeah, that, that there are um, things in common. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, and uh, while that particular manuscript is associated uh, with the uh, Irish uh, earlier, mon earlier medieval uh, monastic tradition, mm -hmm. it has uh, very strong influences from um, uh, art of Rome. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I prefer to see, uh, you know, the, the church in Ireland, I see it being, being distinctive, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we need to remember that that other local churches are also distinctive because they're so uh, much linked to local politics. Yeah. Uh, but um, it is also um, connected mm -hmm. well, to, to the now, head, to Rome. Yeah, exactly. And mm. as Rome is under threat across, you know, from Calvinists and now these Protestants mm. and so it's not just, you know, an Irish Catholic identity being attacked. It's a Roman mm. Catholic. Mm. So maybe there's a cause for them to put together then. So that yeah. other that I was thinking about as you were talking, it were kind of two questions related in a way to class. 
One was I was wondering who were the silversmiths? Like, are they the abbots themselves? You know, who's making the chalices? And then the second thing, which just came up now in conversation, uh, are they monks, you know, bothered by the peasants or are they doing anything with it? Like, it seems like it is a church for wealthy people. You know, are the poor people attending mass and getting mm. alms and being tended to when they're sick and last rites and all this? Uh, or is it very much like it was funny, you know, fantastic to see the women being named these wealthy mm. ladies. Grown your way, I presume, was the Grace O'Malley figure, you know. <laughs> uh, kind of yes, that's the, yeah. uh, the person on the chalice is yeah. the grandmother of uh, oh yeah of the of the, okay yeah, good yeah, yeah. same mm. name <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um so yeah so you know so who are the silversmiths the yes um, mm. so who are the uh, craftsmen um there is one chalice uh that i'm aware of from the uh, 15th century that mentions uh the um, name of a silversmith Oh. The name escapes me now. It's uh, it's a chalice uh, from the north of Ireland, I think from Donegal. Mm. And uh, the name of a silversmith uh, corresponds uh, to the names of the friars in the friary. So okay. it, it, it suggests that one of the friars was actually a silversmith. Okay. Uh, the problem with um, uh, silversmithing in Ireland is that... Um, uh, we don't have maker's marks oh yeah uh, okay. until uh, much later and then when they appear they appear on protestant silver not on catholic mm. silver because it was simply not safe to uh, put yeah, in most mark. cases to put your mark on um, a catholic uh, silver so um, yes a, a difficult question and and you know a very unfortunately you know a vague answer due to survival yeah. of um well, it is of a skill, so presumably mm. it isn't some kind of you know peasant guy it is a, a highly skilled uh mm. craft you know so you yeah. at least you'd be a journeyman and a tradesman and all that mm. maybe a member of a guild i'm very not good yeah. in the medieval yeah. stuff <laughs> and then the other part of that was so then the other yeah so yeah. so the peasants um yeah so uh yes we uh, you know the, the donations come from mm -hmm. uh the wealthy and uh, yeah. they come from uh nobility uh they come from uh merchants um what the poor typically give uh are candles mm. uh because they are affordable yeah. and they are much needed uh in the medieval church and also symbolically you know they, they symbolize uh the uh light uh, mm -hmm. of christ mm -hmm. but what we know um uh about um those kind of, you know, the so-called um, more popular religion, I, I don't particularly like uh, that kind of uh, distinction, is from, I'm, I'm just going to reach for the book, uh, uh, homilies. Um, oh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, homiletic uh, material addressed to different um, uh, social groups, uh, men, mm -hmm. uh, women, uh, different professions, uh, kind of gives us an insight uh, mm -hmm. into uh, people from... Um, kind of uh, I suppose uh, uh, socially and economically lower groups of the society so also uh, images the positioning of images mm. uh, uh, similarly helps us to discern how um, the people congregation in the nave uh, mm -hmm. may have moved around the nave because um, the nave is predominantly for um, kind of uh, people from um, uh, lower social and economic classes, the nobility had their special uh, gallery. Okay. So kind of, uh, you know, the, the space of a church also reflects those social hierarchies. Wow. Uh, but in places such as Ennis, for example, uh, we have um, an image of um, uh, Christ uh, that is located um, at the level of, um, uh, at the eye level. And oh. I imagine it was touched uh, by yeah. uh, people and it is in the nave so it would have been accessed by you know by, public, by anybody yeah. yeah by the public yeah. yeah and I think people didn't sit like it we don't have rows of pews apparently uh, so, yeah. more than likely they were standing yeah. so yeah. Um, I think you know um, uh, there are again you know there are all these kind of um, stories warning people about gossiping in the church and mm -hmm. uh, which means that they were that they were you know were so talking. so coming yeah so so uh, you know you wouldn't have a story warning 
about yeah. uh, you know uh, 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 yeah gossip being inspired by the devil by the devil if they were not doing it so yeah. um yeah um ellen asks she says i'm a little confused about the age of the museum chalice what is it believed to be um so um yeah. i think uh, based on um the style of the middle section which is called uh, the knob Mm -hmm. And when there's a stem, yeah, yeah. The, so this is the, 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 the part which is most telling. Mm -hmm. uh, if we compare it with other uh, objects, we could mm -hmm. say, I think, you know, you, you can never be 100% sure, um, but it appears to be late medieval. Okay, around 14 to 15 something. Stylistically speaking, yes, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, um, in Ireland, particular styles continue well into the 17th century. And I think it is related again to the persecution of the Catholic religion and this kind of harking back uh -huh. to the past. So objects are created uh, with the old style, although, you know, new styles are coming in, Baroque is uh -huh. coming in, uh -huh. but they kind of, you know, they, they continue to use uh, this old style. But I think, um, you know, if we take different aspects of um, uh, research, so style as well as technical analysis, I think yeah. it is kind of, yeah, late medieval. From about the, which is great because you were saying, mm. I mean, you know, if it was a modern metal or something kind of, we would know immediately, oh, it was made in the 19th century to mm. look old. But there is that older, you were saying, like the amalgam. It's, yeah, it is, the, yeah, it is. It is an uh, kind of um, an old way of making things. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I don't think anybody in the... 19th century 20th century would try to make an object that would look like that yeah yeah because yeah. so, wouldn't they have gone way more maybe you know decorative the bowl is very plain and even the little the base mm, i forget what you were mm, calling the base but, yeah so so uh what um uh, i think has happened and this is con kind of confirmed through technical analysis is that mm -hmm. the bowl the knob and the mm -hmm. foot have a different ratio of um uh, metal components, uh, both uh, uh, silver mercury and uh, gold, um, uh, sorry, silver copper, si silver copper uh, alloy and gold uh, mercury uh, mm. gilding. So we could see that the ratio is different in the bowl, in the uh, stem with a knob and the foot, which suggests that they were making, that, that, that they were made at different times okay so that's why you know towards the end of the talk i was saying that um uh, probably the chalice is late medieval it was destroyed mm -hmm. at some point but somebody went into trouble to replace the bowl and the foot and mm -hmm. uh, the object continued its eucharistic uh, usage which is indicated yeah. by the cross which is now missing yeah. So I think, you know, this, the, the chalice itself, if we start with the chalice as an, as an object, mm -hmm. um, it has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. So I and hope, even, I hope, Ellen, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Yeah. And like the fact, the big thing there, I suppose, Gosha, and you were saying, you know, when the uh, British took them, you know, they were using them for drinking vessels. This obviously mm -hmm. remained a sacred object. So it, it mm -hmm. isn't you know, dinged too much because you're not using it in the kitchen, like you're you're using it on Sundays or every morning <clears throat> for mass only. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Mooney is quite, um, you know, descriptive uh, in, in telling about uh, Donegal. He says, you know, they were turned into common yeah. drinking cups, you know, <laughs> so it's like, it's not just drinking cups, they were common drinking cups. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, I think this was absolutely fascinating. You know, I suppose there's without destroying the object you know you can't do too much I, you know i remember my high school history carbon 14 dating and stratigraphy and all that mm. but we have all these computer imaging now and i i mm. get you know the kind of mri type stuff so uh obviously they can do a lot you know in terms of dating but uh you have to kind of blend the two the style as well mm. as the actual you know um yeah unfortunately you know the problem with non-organic materials it's, yeah. it's more difficult it's more difficult to date them. yeah 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 so i think if there aren't any other questions um i'm just looking everyone is still with us which is lovely uh but if you do have a question please type it in there's nothing sorry if i could just say something i just please. as i was listening to myself <laughs> i i i um uh 
noted that uh, I call one of Kilconnell chalices being made in 1689. It was recorded in 1689. It was made in the 16th century, oh, in, uh, 15, 15, 1532. And it is on the slide. I just, you know, I was caught in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so apologies. So yeah. Yeah. No. I well, aged I the chalice by 150 years. Yeah. But it's, it's fascinating to think, you know, that they had this huge network you know that there's all this correspondence going back and forth mm. and then the upheaval of the banishment and you know I suppose it was mm. very violent Gosha well you know I think 17th century I, I yeah. think is uh, is a very tragic century yeah. in Ireland here yeah, and and um, I think the objects are the unfortunate reflection of it you know and yeah. uh, you know the, the human suffering is mm -hmm. um, yeah it's you know on a different level yeah, there's a place near us at home in Kerry called Glown Naclusa, which means Glen of the Ears. And right. I can't really remember the story. You know, I, I think it was that they were ringing the bells to warn people that the soldiers were coming, mm. Cromwellian mm. probably time. Mm. And they managed to talk their way out of being, you know, burned out of the abbey, whatever it was. And as they were going, somebody taunted one of the soldiers, apparently. Mm. And he, they came back and cut off all the ears off the monks so they would never hear the bells ringing it that must have been it that they were ringing the bells as they were yeah, leaving to yeah, kind of yeah. you know taunt them but yeah, you know very yeah. cool and mm. we've beautiful our art fort is near me at home and um you, you know there's a couple of others patricia says thank you this has been yeah. fascinating um yes yeah, so artwork mokris abbey is you know a fabulous one mm. too with that the yeah. tree in the middle you know mm. so indeed yeah, um, yeah yeah in the cloister Mm. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, very good examples of those cloisters even, you know, and it's mm. interesting to see, I never, you know, you go into them now and they're, I say, roofless and there might be a wall missing somewhere. It's, they're a very different shape church from what we're used to. So, you know, I we'd be in there going, well, where would you put the altar and where is the confessional box? Mm. And, you know, it's a very different layout from mm. more modern churches. So it was good to get that floor plan from you too. Yes, so, so, so well, in relation to confession, again, um, we can kind of guess from uh, drawings that mm. uh, possibly, you know, it was uh, a confessor sitting down and somebody kneeling in front. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, it wasn't really a kind of a, a confession box. Uh, yeah. It was uh, kind of compulsory for uh, all Christians to go to confession once a year. So it oh, must have been quite, you know, quite kind of... Um, uh, an arduous uh, thing yeah. to do for the friars and the monks um, yeah. uh, and it's a and, long narrow building you know I, I yes you were yeah, showing and, us and, picture, and, yeah yeah it's very yeah. different like you know they're in that sacred mm. space up and even the the wall which as you say is permeable but it's very clearly defining like this is where the transubstantiation and the miracle is happening mm. and the rest yeah of the yeah year. yeah so so yeah so so that's why I, I i kind of refer to it as as the liturgical drama because you know the whole yeah. structure uh, yeah. of the church is to enhance the drama mm -hmm. of uh, of the uh, eucharist and uh, transubstantiation mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and when you think about you know in a way particularly i guess for the peasants like mm you know to see the stained glass the artwork to smell the incense it's a very transformative experience sensually for them mm. you know to come in out of these little thatched cottages that they were living in it might have been different you know for the lord of the manor or the chieftain or you know whoever it was but that it was a very i ne never thought of it that way like that actually they might have been transported you know sensually mm. by going into this building because mm. it's so decorative you know and so kind of maybe formal and a little bit intimidating you know but which is exactly what you want if you're trying to worship a higher power you know yes but yeah. then but then you have uh, uh friars who are kind of uh, preaching in the fields yeah you know? so, so they kind of go out uh uh, to preach they preach in um two languages uh, they also yeah. put on plays mm -hmm. you know liturgical plays Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's it's about kind of bringing that uh uh, my, mystery of Christ, mystery of of the Bible. Again, yeah. you know, making it more kind of uh, approachable, making it yeah. uh, more towards uh, the masses. And and I think mm -hmm. in relation to the Franciscans, you know, which is my area of expertise, uh, it comes very strongly from the figure mm -hmm. of Francis himself. You know, the does, yeah. kind of uh, this itinerant uh, preacher mm -hmm. who would um, kind of occasionally uh, burst into a song mm -hmm. if he wanted to convey a message. So so mm -hmm. this sort of kind of um, uh drama um 
yeah, kind of going to the people, pastoral care, uh, mm -hmm. kind of external engagement, mm -hmm. you know, so to speak, is is very much part of the mendicant ethos. Yeah, I know that that's great. So, um, yep, um, Linda has said thank you. Very interesting as well. And yeah, Patricia, so we're delighted. I'll just quickly check YouTube, but this was brilliant. Um, I should say we'll be back on April 30th, which is May Eve. It's uh, We're going to the opposite end of the spectrum now, Gosia. We're going to have a talk on the 30th from a folklorist at home in Ireland who is going to talk to us about precautions and superstitions and pish oh, oaks, which are yeah. Yeah, kind of ready yeah, yeah, yeah. to protect you because May Eve, mm. the, the eve of May Day, is a very uh, liminal time at home in Ireland. And, you know, mm. it's a very powerful time where people could maybe put curses or, you know, so you have to protect your buildings and your animals. So that will be up online on the 30th. And next week we will have the long awaited chat with, uh, thanks, Ellen, uh, the long awaited chat with Malachi McCourt. I finally got to record him the other day. So um, I'll put that chat up online. And then on the 21st of May in the museum, we have the fantastic Margaret McAuliffe, who is on tour in America at the moment, presenting her one woman show, um, The Humours of Bandon, which is all about the, the heartbreak and drama of Irish dance. And there'll be a few mm -hmm. other things. We just haven't scheduled them yet. So I want to thank you, Dr. Dalton, so much. This was very good. I'm delighted uh, to have you. Pleasure. <laughs> and yeah. come see the chalice while we still have it it'll be going definitely it's going to monaco in september i'm not sure if it'll be leaving albany uh soon but yeah you know, i i had the pleasure to see it actually when when uh, the chalice was here uh, around christmas time so yeah, uh, yeah oh, it is beautiful. it is quite exquisite yeah mm. yeah yeah and it's you know okay. just to see something so old you know is, is mm. amazing yeah indeed. and we thank the the entrepreneur who purchased it and, and made it available to the museum so thank you very much, everyone. Have a great uh, night. Thank and you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. Good night. Good, good night.